You're listening to T-Wolf Talk on the Revolution Rev 89. I'm Michelle Wells, radio tech for KTSE Pueblo, and joining me today is Barbara Jackson. She is the health promotion specialist for the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment. Thanks so much for joining me today, Barbara. I really appreciate the invitation, Michelle. Thank you. Absolutely. Glad you could make it. So first off, can you give our listeners a little background about yourself and your work with the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, as a health promotion specialist, I've been working in an initiative to reduce the number of deaths due to overdose. So I think of it as substance misuse prevention. And early on, a lot of the efforts were geared towards the safe use, safe storage, and safe disposal of medications. And though those topics are still really critical and important for people to understand, this year I have been working on community education. So our first series looked at pregnancy, parenting, and multi-generational trauma and use and the resources in our community that can help people choose a different path or choose a healthier path for their lives. The one that we're working on now is called Your Words Have Power, Let's Share Hope. And it is really all about reducing the stigma that people experience about seeking treatment. So it is actually the number one reason people cite that they don't seek treatment is that fear of judgment. So we have an art exhibit that we're taking to various places in the community and it's built upon real people and their lived experience. So these are individuals who live in Pueblo County Um, I have interviewed them, and we have a voice recording of that interview. I've taken a photograph that really shows the humanity of the person. And then we've created like a laser tell. What is that little nugget of gold they want everybody to know? So that's what we're going around the community with, is that image blown up full size poster size 24 by 36 and that narration that little nugget of their experience and then at each location we have a period of time or an event where the actual storytellers are present themselves and they can interact with the community Wow, that is incredible. So going back to what you said about the your words have power traveling exhibits, uh, where did that slogan come from? Oh, I love this question. So one of the peers, her name is Jean. She talks about being young, being 14 years old and experimenting, just trying things out. But her substance use and maybe the people that she was with when she was doing it frightened her parents. It frightened them so much they actually wanted to remove her from that environment And she ended up in a program where she had to attend at 14, a 12-step program, and was required to stand up and say, hi, I'm Jean, and I'm an addict. And she cites that those words had the power to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for her life for the next 20 years. And though it was deeply unintended, it, it remained her truth and became her path because the words that we tell one another, the words that we tell ourselves can really limit who we become, who we experience ourselves to be, or they can inspire and empower one another and ourselves. So we want to share hope and we want to be inspiring to our fellow Pueblo County residents and beyond. Wow, I just got chills hearing that story. That is incredible. Thank you for that. 
And so the concept of a traveling exhibit itself is really a unique one. So what made you all decide to deliver your information this way? You know, um, it has taken me three years of working within substance misuse prevention to really understand who my audience is. As a health promotion specialist in public health, we really look at what's called population health. We look at the whole community as that single point rather than individuals and giving individual treatment. So for a long time, I really felt like I was trying to reach people in active use. And I realize now that it's truly the loved ones, it's the family members, it's the greater community that I wanna talk to and that I want to share these messages with so that they know, well, number one, that we don't keep these secrets of shame about the medical condition of substance use or mental health issues in our family closets. I think it is really prevalent throughout probably the world that substance use is an issue. I've learned that substance use comes about in people's lives in many different ways. Sometimes it's from the young person that's experimenting. Sometimes it's from a prescription that they've gotten for pain, like wisdom teeth removal or a sports injury, and they have to rehab and have a lot of pain. And the doctor in that, you know, compassionate way writes a prescription that then becomes an addiction. Sometimes it is because of trauma, something that's happened that they feel a need to self-medicate from. But it is the one thing that unites all of those, and that is the stigma and the fear of judgment that keeps people from being treated and receiving resources and support for the addiction. So if I'm able to go out and have these conversations with our community members in the light of day, in um, an artistic and beautiful way, in a way of expressing the humanity of this is all of us on some level, we have all been touched by a loved one or a colleague or someone we have admired in our lives that perhaps misuses alcohol or another maybe not legal substance. So I think it's it's being able to go where people are and then inviting those conversations that created this ability, this exhibit to be able to go out and meet with people. Wow, very well said. Thank you for that. And so does Pueblo have a high rate of substance misuse and mental illness then? Well, we have data that, of course, as health department professionals, we really do want to make sure that the funding that we receive being targeted towards population health is driven by the needs of our greater community. And we have seen by the data that there is substance use, there is overdose occurrence, there are those that enter into various systems like the justice system and then, you know, the human services systems that have these issues. And it's documented in that um, data. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but what we do have for those that are really interested in the data on our website, at PuebloHealth.org, there is a data dashboard about substance use in our community. And it's rich in information from our partners that report and then we collate all that data and it's available on our website, giving 
gender sometimes, age, what the circumstances are. Even from the coroner, we get information about deaths and what kind of substances are in the system. One of our partners, of course, is healthcare and babies being born with positive toxicology screens and what kind of substances are in their bodies at birth. Which is why the very first series that we did this year was called In a Family Way. And it was a four-part series where we looked at pregnancy and then parenting and then that multi-generational aspect of substance use. And that is all available on our YouTube channel. And it's also linked in with this exhibit on our virtual home, our webpage. I'll give you that address in just a moment. So if the peers that have been a part of your words have power, let's share hope, were part of a previous presentation, we've been able to link that video to, I guess, their profile on our webpage, which can be found at pueblohealth.org. There'll be a dark box with options and you want to click on the A to Z directory and then look for substance misuse or prevention of substance misuse. And that will take you to our webpage and there's another link there for your words have power, let's share hope. But there's a lot of resources in the community and of course it's based upon needing to share that out with our community members because it is a medical condition that is prevalent in Pueblo. Great to know. Thank you for that. So have you seen an increase in people who have been seeking help since the starting of the traveling exhibits and your words have power? Thank you for that. Boy, I would love, even anecdotally, to know that's been the case. What I can share, we really launched this exhibit three weeks ago. So it had a piloting week at the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment. We had storyboards and the art posters in two locations in our building for a week. And then we had three storyteller events. And I found that the most impactful and powerful thing that came out of the storyteller events were that people were able to ask very personal questions such as, I have a cousin, I have a son, I have a nephew, I have a daughter, my wife, how can I help them? And then, you know, further giving like scenarios that happened and wanting to find out how they can respond in a really positive and impactful way. And there's three things that we really want to highlight that all people can do when they have concern about a loved one with a substance use disorder. And the first thing is always take care of yourself first. And I say this because your own health and well-being is what strengthens you and the relationships you have with your family members that allows that person with the substance use disorder to sometimes remember who they are, to remember what they've experienced in their life. And we want to make sure that people are focusing on what they have some control over. So we have control over what we do, but we never have control over what another person does. So number one, take care of yourself first. Number two, tell your loved one that you love them, the person. You love the person that they are, not the behavior. And then this is maybe sometimes the hardest. Number three is let the consequences happen because it's how we all learn. We learn from the consequences of our actions. And as a parent, we have this sense that we need to protect. And sometimes we carry that too far. And I've had many of these peers who have shared their story and their journey with me through this project talk about the judicial system being the saving grace 
and that it was when those consequences came full face, they had to acknowledge that the choices that they made put them in a position where their freedoms and their options were really minimized. And that was when they chose a different path. But we have to remember that everyone comes to substance use in a unique way. It's the same thing with recovery. There is no one right way. It has to be driven by the individual themselves. Wow, that is absolutely mind-blowing. I am speechless right now. And that was one of the things that was weighing on my mind is how family members who have a loved one with substance misuse issues or mental health issues, how they could help. And you explained that perfectly. So going back to your first tip about always taking care of yourself, what does that entail? You know, there are some programs in Pueblo that have, I think it's an eight-week class, and it's called CRAFT. Essentially, what it is, is teaching families how to be healthy. And that really is about, you know, how do you strengthen and build the communication? And I guess, you know, even backing up a minute, recognizing what is your responsibility and what isn't. And that is just a gosh darn hard thing to believe sometimes that, well, I will use myself. I was raised by a parent who had an alcohol issue. And I had a lot of conversations with myself about, gosh darn it, if I just did my chores, or if I just you know, came home on time, or if I just did something, then I wouldn't have triggered them to drink. And honestly, you know, that was really self-defeating all the way around because that was out of my control. And so we have to, as family members, recognize what is within our control. And it's not ever the behavior of another person. So you do things that encourage and strengthen yourself. And you build relationships and hobbies and interests that bring harmony and balance and fun and after and just getting you through the hard times because you have these trust-based relationships with your family members. So I would say that was, you know, number one. And then you go down like this whole other, and in this moment, gosh darn it, I do not remember what all the components of the group are, but... Um, There are several folks here in town that teach the craft program. And then beyond that, it is taking care of oneself is literally sleeping well, having good relationships, eating a good diet, having exercise. And maybe that means going to the park and feeding the birds. You know, it's the things that really make you feel like you've got what you need in your own life to feel good and be healthy. That's terrific to know. Thank you for explaining that. Very well said. Going back to what you said about the stigma, where are some places that you see substance misuse and mental health stigma occur most? Boy, I mean, if you go to the website and you listen to some of the voice recordings, our 11 who were in active use cite many different scenarios. Everything from the self-stigma of, I felt like I could do anything in life, that I could conquer anything that I had, a strength and a will to be self-directed. But then in the midst of IV heroin use, realized that will is not enough to get someone into recovery. It literally took the access to medically assisted treatment, which is another substance that will bind with the opioid receptors in the brain, giving that person access to the freedom of not feeling compelled to continue to use. And that was self-stigma, an example of self-stigma. There's another participant that talks about after many years of substance use and in and out of homelessness, 
going into a retail store, whether it be a grocery store or a dollar store or some other kind of store, and being profiled, if you will, as a high risk individual. And she would hear them say over the loudspeaker in the store, well, whatever their code word is, you know, watch for this person they just came in. I bet they're going to be stealing things from us. And you can go into care centers, hospitals, or even your primary care physician. And if there is not that sense of, if they don't specialize in medically assisted treatment, sometimes there's just a disconnect. And I think we all experience a level of burnout in our lives where, well, we recognize that healthcare professionals continue to take care of us at our weakest moments in life, at those times when we can't care for ourselves and we need specialized help. But maybe they do it today and they feel good. They brought us back from the brink of whatever and they release us. And then a month or two or three or a year passes and we come back in and we have the same issue because we haven't changed our behavior. And there's this sense of fruitlessness and burnout that can occur. And those are some of the things that I would also like to combat is making sure that there's resilience in all of the systems that care for people. Because we have to recognize that even when we see someone at their personal lowest moment, we have to remember to recognize that that's not all there is. So stigma is everywhere and including our own heads. Great explanation. And so unfortunately there is a stigma surrounding substance misuse and mental illness as you touched on many times. So why do you think that this stigma exists for both mental illness and substance misuse still? I think historically that there has been a misunderstanding about the medical and chemical in our brain aspect of the way the body works. We have a brilliant addiction psychiatrist that is part of our presentation. Her name is Dr. Libby Stout. And on our website, she speaks about the science of addiction and she talks about the dopamine cycle in the brain. And so it is not a chosen path. It is a biological path that takes place with our own bodies and our own body's chemistry and the way that it works. And essentially when you experience something pleasurable, like the first time you eat ice cream, and it's so marvelous because it's 95 degrees out and you get to have ice cream and it's cool and it's sweet and it's creamy and you love it and your body releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine and it binds with that receptor in your brain and you say i'm gonna remember this and i'm gonna do it again well that occurs with other substances as well and that is kind of the cycle that can occur with substance use. It becomes a bit of an oasis, and it is a false oasis, but it is nonetheless one that your body craves, which makes it a medical condition. I would say mental health, I'm less competent about speaking about mental health issues, but I can say from just looking at society and knowing the history of society that we misunderstand yet another medical condition. And we think somehow it is a personality flaw or a moral failing that people have. Again, like there's an imbalance of neurotransmitters or the chemistry of our body is out of whack for whatever reason. And until we have treatment from a professional, from a subject matter expert, we will be in some state of imbalance, which means that our 
full-blown potential and functioning within the world is minimized, and people misunderstand that. Wow, that's fascinating. It's so fascinating to hear an expert's opinion on that. Thank you for sharing that. Do you worry that someone who has never misused a substance before and is seeking help for a severe mental illness won't want to come to these events because they don't want to be labeled as a substance misuser? And if so, what would you say to those who are seeking help for a severe mental illness? Okay, that's a big question. Um, And you're right. I mean, sometimes there is a stigma associated with even going to an art exhibit about a particular topic. I would like to invite everybody. We are going to be at the Farmer's Market at Mineral Palace Park tomorrow, which will be Friday, July 23rd. We're going to be there with two of our storytellers. One of them talks about losing a decade of his life because he thought, I'll just use one more time. I'm only 20. It's not a big deal. And then, of course, he woke up at 30 and decided this is it. And he had the support of his father, who is a medical doctor here in our community and does medical assisted treatment. Um, The other guest that we will have featured storyteller is Dr. Libby Stout. And she is an addiction psychiatrist who worked at the state hospital for many years and worked within a very robust and successful treatment program called the Circle Program. So if you have questions related specifically to mental illness, this would be an extraordinary opportunity to ask your questions directly to a very well-qualified medical professional. Beyond that, it is imperative that you seek treatment because we do know that there is medical treatment and behavioral treatment for both mental illness and substance use disorder. So if you go again to PuebloHealth.org, you click on prevent substance misuse and you scroll down, you will see a treatment roadmap link. And it is a, I would like to say it's comprehensive, but I'm going to say it's the most comprehensive we have been able to make. It has just been updated in June of this year, and it helps guide you to know what the resources in the community are. For instance, I'm looking at the orange bubbles, and it says I'm pregnant and using what are my options? And it literally shows you who provides support for people that might be pregnant and using. There's using and wants to stop. There's current use. There's peer resources. There's jail. There's a loved one is addicted. And again, all of these treatment sources are on this one form. I've got to give a plug to another tool that we have on our website, and it's called the Personal Choice Guide. So many of us really don't like to make decisions. Like making a decision is sometimes one of the hardest things we can do. And I don't know about everyone else, but I certainly didn't get a lot of guidance in how to make a decision. So... Well, this forum started in Ottawa, Canada in the 1970s for use in their medical system where maybe a patient had to choose a risky surgical procedure or a drug therapy that wasn't, you know, really vetted yet. And their doctor created this forum to work through all of the issues that go into making a decision that has risk and consequences to it. So we adapted this to a more general discussion about making choices. And it starts out with saying, what choice do I need to make? Is there a timeline? And so what happens if I make this choice? And then what will happen if I don't? Recognizing that there are consequences to both making a decision and there's consequences when you ignore it and don't make a decision. 
then it asks you, what are some of the things that make the choice hard? And sometimes it's scary or it's making you sad or there's bad memories. And sometimes it's things like, I don't have transportation or I can't afford this. Then in the center of this form are three choices. You can literally plug in what your three options are. So in terms of substance use, I like to give the example of maybe it's harm reduction, getting clean needles, getting fentanyl test strips, having testing for HIV, Hep C, and STIs. Then maybe the center section could be, or choice two could be outpatient treatment, you know, going and getting medically assisted treatment and then getting some behavioral health. But maybe also it could be the third choice, inpatient, where there's a lot of support and a lot of structure and you're literally, you're just really narrowing who you're interacting with. And then you identify what are the reasons this choice might be helpful and how important is that to me? Consequently, you also want to say, well, why would I avoid that choice and what could possibly go wrong? And how important is that? And then we ask you to think about who the helpers are in your life. We ask for three names of people that have maybe walked before you and have experience they can share. Maybe there's somebody that really loves you and wants what's best for you. And maybe it's somebody at a program that you've heard about that can help you get in. And then the final question is, what's your next step? Once you understand you've had that kind of self-reflection about what's valuable to your life and what you believe in, and then you're going to be more likely to make a sustainable decision that's really based on your own values. That's on our website. It's called the Personal Choice Guide, and there's even a very short video that just walks you through how to use it. That's incredible. Thank you for providing that resource. I'm sure that's extremely helpful to a lot of people. So thank you for that. What other events do you have planned in the near future? And when and where can we see the Your Words Have Power traveling exhibits again? Yay, thank you for that question. So Mineral Palace Park on Friday the 23rd of July, and then look for us at the Patrick Lucero Library at 1315 East 7th Street. We're gonna be there from August 19th through the 27th. And we've highlighted Monday, August 23rd as our storyteller event, but it is entirely possible we will do more than one. Then for your specific audience, we're gonna be at CSU Pueblo um, September 6th through the 8th. I believe it's going to be in the Oceato Center in the Great Room. There's going to be a reception with a panel discussion on that Monday, the 6th of September. And we would love to have some really robust, fabulous conversations with students that are maybe even going into some of these fields like nursing or social work or criminal justice psychology and then really you know anybody who wants an opportunity to kind of check in with their own personal biases and recognizing what some of the impacts of stigma are i forgot to mention one really super exciting event august 21st it's a saturday we are going to be at the friendly harbor community center which is on 2713 North Grand Avenue. And it's going to indeed be the exhibit with four storytellers there, but also a resource fair. So Front Range Clinic is planning to bring their mobile treatment lab, which is how they go to outlying uh, communities and offer medically assisted treatment. It, there'll be tours. I don't know that they'll be doing spontaneous inductions, but 
I won't say no. It's also an equity clinic for the COVID-19 vaccinations. There will be WIC, which is Women, Infants, and Children, and food uh, support for families that um, need some, some help in getting healthy nutrition for their family members. They'll be doing eligibility checks and actual enrollments. There will be a treatment, and I say treatment, it's actually a therapy. Uh, it's not exactly a therapy either. It is a method. It's called AccuDetox, and it is auricular acupuncture. So there's five needles at specific locations in each ear lobe or ear structure. And they correspond to three organs that detoxify the body and two additional uh, sites that work on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. And then another one that creates harmony and restores that sense of peace and mental acuity. It gives you focus, it gives you relaxation. There's no talking that goes on with it. It is just simply a, the placement of five needles in your ear and then some letting go, some deep letting go. There'll be people there that will be offering Accu Detox treatments. Uh, there'll be food trucks. And then there's gonna be, oh, there's a labyrinth. There's a marvelous labyrinth that you can walk. And it's gonna be very family friendly. Oh, and there's also going to be screenings for sexually transmitted infections, STIs, HIV, and Hep C, and then information about more services of harm reduction, including naloxone training and distribution. Naloxone being the medication that kicks the opioid off the receptor in the brain when there's an overdose occurring from an opioid and it brings the person back. So instead of that breathing being depressed to the point of death, the person is revived from that state and is given another chance to choose. So that's gonna be occurring, really important resource fair and storyteller event at Friendly Harbor Community Center on Saturday, August 21st from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. I can't believe that's going to be in our community. That's amazing, all that you guys are offering. We're excited. That's great. And so what do you hope listeners take away from our interview today? I hope that everyone has found something that will enrich their lives, something that will give them some peace, something that gives them hope, no matter what it was. Great answer. Thank you. And is there anything at all that we haven't talked about that you would like to say or like the listeners to know or anything you'd like to include that we didn't mention today? I really want to be sure that people can navigate to our webpage so that you can view this project, even if it's beyond the time when we're in the community, it will still live on our webpage and it will give you ideas and it will give you perhaps talking points with your own family members. So that would be PuebloHealth.org, going to the A to Z directory and choosing Prevent Substance Misuse. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Barbara, for joining me today to talk about the Your Words Have Power traveling exhibits and how they serve this community. You can listen to this episode of T-Wolf Talk again by searching Rev89 Productions on Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. Join us again next Sunday morning at 7 for T-Wolf Talk on the Revolution Rev89. And I'm here with Dr. Libby Stout. I would like to know, have you ever written a prescription for hope? Well, I haven't actually written one, but I think it's a great idea because I talk about hope all the time. So, I mean, one of the reasons I work in this field is I love working with people that are dealing with issues, you know, whether it's mental health issues or substance use issues, because what I find is when they actually deal with those issues and recover, they're... They're healthier than most people that have never had those issues because they have learned from 
their problems. And I always try and put out there that, you know, this is totally recoverable. So, like, if you have an addiction issue, you can totally recover from that. That doesn't mean you can put that substance back in your body and do it appropriately. That's not what recovery means. Recovery means that you actually have learned how to live without that that substance and to live better because you're not using that substance and you don't need that substance. And so what we find in neuroscience, for example, is that the brain is really resilient and we actually have neuroplasticity in our brain. And when you stop abusing it and you do things to help it, it actually can recover. And so, and then people can actually start learning from the experiences they had. That's one thing I really love about AA or support groups is if you kind of follow somebody through the, that process, when they first start, it's all about all the bad things that happened to them mm -hmm. and then the substances and then the bad things that the substances made them do. But as they get further along in their recovery, away from that, they start talking about the impact they've had on other people and the bad things they've done to other people and how they're making amends for that and how they're moving on and learning from that. And that that's a process that is beautiful to watch. And it's really possible for people to do. Uh, and, and people do it in many different ways. You know, there's a lot of different ways how to how to access recovery. And that's the other reason I, I, I went into this field because I found out when I was in medical school that the only people that really, quote, cure anyone are surgeons. Mm -hmm. You think about it, because they just, they identify the problem, they cut it out, and you're better. But everybody else is struggling with trying to get you to change your behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I like about substance abuse is we teach people how to do that as opposed to saying this is what you need to do you know and we'll do this for you and I'll do this for you it's it just you're teaching people that these are things that they have to do themselves I mean it has to come from the inside out that's the other reason I really like oriental medicine or traditional Chinese medicine and that's why I train ear acupuncture because that's really helping access people from the inside. So it's helping kind of access their own internal sources of healing and their abilities to cope. And it's, you know, the way Chinese medicine looks at it is you're how you have, we have this life force energy called qi. We don't really know what that is in Western medicine, but what we want to do is move it and nourish it. And when you're having any kind of issues, the problem is your chi is diminished or stagnant. And that's what the acupuncture does, is it helps kind of move it, nourish it. But it's really your own energy, your own energy source. So although I would aid that by putting the needles in, I'm not the one doing it. But the other thing when we train people to do this is a really big part of that treatment is your intention. Mm. So what you are thinking when you're putting the needles in that person. And, and you can have a positive intention or a negative intention. And the person, whether they know it or not, will experience that. And that's, that's actually why I don't think we'll ever get the studies that people want in Western medicine. You know, the, the randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials that prove something works are very difficult to do with this kind of medicine because you can't blind yeah. people. You can blind the recipient, but you cannot blind the therapist. Yeah. And so if you know, you're know you comparing a real treatment point to a sham treatment point, and the person is putting it in the sham point, they're, in their mind they're going, well, this isn't the right point, and I know this isn't going to work, but we'll try it anyway. <laughs> ah. I just, that's an aside. <laughs> no, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. So, getting back to that, have I ever written a prescription for hope? No, but I would 
be happy to do so for people. If, if people could actually take that and say, this is what I need. I, I have hope now. Yes. I think your message is one that's very hopeful because you talk about recovery as something that's available and an option for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I've always said, having run many treatment programs, that somebody who's finished the program and is doing really well, I would hire them immediately over anybody that I didn't know their history mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. um, because people that really find recovery like I said, are really healthy people because they know the dark side and they know the, the light side. And people that are just kind of moving along in life, kind of dabbling in little things, but never have really experienced any, anything really powerful, mm -hmm. don't even know that it's out there. So that again goes back to Chinese medicine, you know, looking at the yin and the yang. Because everything is really balanced. That's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's that, you know, there's a dark side and a light side to everything. Mm -hmm. And as long as we recognize that and we maintain balance and accept the fact that sometimes there's going to be bad things happen, but there's usually a light at the end of the tunnel and things get better as long as we keep focusing on the purpose. That's that intention again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so sure. much for sure. being a part of your words have power. Yeah. These have been powerful words. And well, I hope so. I yeah. love the idea of hope yeah. for all of us. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I got my wisdom teeth taken out, and I took opiates for the pain, and uh, I got a real high off of it. Now I've like I've smoked a lot of pot, I drink a lot of alcohol and beer, wine, liquor, all of that. Um, see, um, really, really harmful shit. So I don't know. I kind of got because there was already stigma, and there was, and there, uh, you know, people today might not even bat an eye at that you're smoking pot or that your parents freaked out. I'm saying I don't know. I'm not a kid today. But I, I imagine it's a lot more, um, I hear that people use them more and more all the time. So I would guess that there might not be as much like, but for me, it was really screwed up. Um, I was really, really embarrassed, really, 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 really hurt. That me using led to me having more severe mental illness symptoms. I'm not a fan of people using these days. I think it's really unhealthy. I don't necessarily think drugs are just all bad, but I think they're a lot more bad than good. I think that when people use a lot of substances or even just become a pothead, I mean, I hate to use that term, but like seriously, they would become like a pothead or an alcoholic, and I just think it's really, really bad for their, for their soul even, you know, for them as a as a being of, you know, as a created, I, I'm, I'm a believer in the Lord, like really hard believer and that. I don't like organized religion either, by the way, but I do believe there's something more than this. Yes. And I think it kind of separates you from others when you're using, because I think there's a real sense of isolation that was for me when I first started, um, not using all the time, but using more. Um, and it became more and more. At first, it was a real social thing. Like, I wanted to get high with my friends and stuff. But by the end of it, I was isolated. I'd almost rather have my substances, whatever I was using at the time. A lot of times, I'd want it just that more than anything. And then it ended up being that I would have the substances and I wouldn't have friends. And then I started to feel like I wanted friends again. But then a lot of times it also felt like there was still that lack of connection. I feel like they were there a lot of times because I had dope and they wanted that as well. So it was almost like I was prostituting, well, not prostituting myself, but like prostituting the drugs I had even, which was stuff I had worked for in a lot of ways for friendships. So it was kind of like, 
prostituting myself in the sense that I wasn't letting them love me for me. I was letting them love me for drugs. That's all I mean. I just, maybe not prostituting, but um, real needy. And I guess because it kind of came full circle, I started using so I could hang out with cool kids, but also so I could have more friends. Then I got, well, then I got to, okay, I just want to use these substances. I don't really need to be around everybody. And then it came right back to now I have this stuff. I've got better connects and shit. You know, I'm older. There's more stable stuff. You know, that I had more steady supplies of things and my friends weren't there. So, I mean, it got to the point at one point, and this was really dangerous, as I drive out of town, but I'd have drugs on me so they could hang out with friends, but then would use the drugs. And then they'd go off and meet with their other friends in their groups. And no, but it was, yeah, it was, I have so much shit I could tell you, but it's just stupid. It's stupid how much, and I just, yeah. And the longer I've been sober, the more I've realized uh, I don't need that. But now people, I mean, I'm sober. I do have friends. People aren't around me for drugs. And maybe I won't always be connected with them, but I have more like, self-worth and self-esteem and I don't feel like I need to get high before I do something even fun which is how I felt for a long time I don't feel like I need to use drugs to feel normal which is how I used to feel after a time it got really to that point I didn't feel like I could fully experience anything in life and have any real joy without that I really felt like it was like you know so I don't know that's kind of my story but the stigma is terrible. Um, I don't feel like doing substances makes you makes you subhuman, but I feel like it can make you feel that way. So I guess that's what I have to say. Ashley, thank you for meeting with me today. I would like to hear about your story of stigma. This is when I was still actively using. And um, it's not a secret that I was an IV drug user, primarily opioids, mixing with stimulants, methamphetamine. I had gotten very sick, very, very sick, running a fever, I mean, pushing 104, um, couldn't walk from infection in my knees, but I didn't know that at the time. Chest, I mean, it was just, it was all bad. And of course, being an addict, due to the stigma that we face on a daily basis, you don't want to go to a doctor whether it's a public health center, whether it's an emergency room, whether it's outpatient, or even one of these free homeless clinics. You don't want to go. Well, it got to the point, though, where I had to go. Um, the vision kind of messed up in my left eye. I couldn't walk, could hardly breathe. My fever was 104 and a half. Finally, my mom wound up calling an ambulance, and we have two hospitals here in town. The first hospital I went to, because I got there via ambulance, they drew my blood, they, you know, were running um, vitals, the whole nine yards. They had a doctor come in and especially look at my eye, and they said, we need to, you know, get you transferred somewhere, or you're going to lose vision in that eye. Mm -hmm. I was in a lot of pain. Now, I had used that day, so I wasn't dope-seeking. I was sick, and I needed help, desperately needed help. The practitioner that I was seeing, she um, gave me a, a dose of fentanyl via IV, IV fentanyl, a very low dose. And being an IV drug user with opioids, I have a tolerance. It's not my fault. Well, it is, but <laughs> it's my fault, obviously. But, it, you know, I, I can't control that tolerance. Um, and I was still crying, still in pain, still miserable. Um, and I told her, you know, is there anything else? I didn't say, is there any other narcotics, any other pain? Is there anything else you can supplement for pain? And I will never forget this. She turned, she was standing at the counter at the sink area um, in the room that I was in. And she turned around and she had um, an ink pen in her hand. And she said, I just gave you a big old fat dose of fentanyl. And here you are asking for more shit. I think you're in here dope seeking. I think you're fine. And I said, you know what? I'm leaving. Get me the paperwork. I want to go AMA. 
And she said, if you, you know, and she was like, excuse me? She said, you want to go AMA? And I said, yep, I want to go AMA. And she looked at my mom and my mom said, I, I, you know, kind of shrugged her shoulders, you know, what is she going to say at this point? She took that ink pen, and I'm not joking, and threw it down at me at the bed and said, you can't walk, you're going to go blind, you got a fever, if you leave here, you will die. And I said, I'd rather die than be here under your care. So she went and got the paperwork and she came back in and mom said, do you want to talk to the doctor? And the nurse said, oh, she wants to leave AMA, let her leave AMA, let her go, you know, kill herself. What does AMA mean? Against medical advice. Oh. Because they wanted to admit me. They wanted to, to transfer me to another hospital because, I mean, there's, unfortunately, when it comes to, you know, eye stuff, um, vision stuff, whatever, um, they don't have the trauma specialists that they need here to, you know, save vision. Right. Um, right. And so uh, they wanted to, to transfer me to a different hospital, either in the Springs or Denver, wherever they could find one. But, of course, because of the way that nurse treated me, I mean, that was terrifying. Yeah. You know, if, if you're going to be treated that way in the emergency department, why do I want to be admitted to your hospital? So we wound up leaving AMA. Um, my mom said, you know, I, I don't blame her. You know, after the way you treat her, I don't blame her. And I wound up going home, and I told my mom, I said, I'll go back to the hospital. But, like, I said, well, they gave me antibiotics. I should be okay. Because all she explained to me at that time and all they could really tell was that I had an infection in my eye that was going to cause me to go blind if I didn't get it treated. And I was septic. But they gave me, yeah, they, yeah, they gave me some pretty potent antibiotics and things like that. And like I said, that was on the 6th. The 9th, I used the 9th, and the morning of the 10th, I called my mom and I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go back to the hospital today. Because by this point in time, my other knee started swelling up, and so, like, I couldn't even hobble. Like, before I could hop on one leg, now I can't even do that. My vision is bad. I mean, it's, it's just fried in that left eye now at this point. Um, my fever is getting closer to 105. I think it was over 105 at one point in time. And by the time my mom got to my house, um, we were sitting there, and I'm not going to lie, I was waiting on a fix. I was waiting on a delivery before I go to the hospital because I knew I was going to be there for a while. And um, I started arguing with my mom about something. I can't even really remember what it was at this point in time. Like, I just, I, I instantly slipped into a state of full-on delirium full-on delirium the last thing i remember was staring at my dead grandfather standing across the room from me and i looked at my mom and i said you need to call 911 right now and it's you know it's like i've said before in the abstract i kind of remember the ambulance driver leaning over me going have you used today and i said no and then flash again and i'm in the back of the ambulance and i'm crying and i said mom where are you she said i'm going with you and then flash again it's nine days later and i'm in the icu what had happened was between the sixth and the tenth my cornea had actually perforated at that point, and there is no going back. Um, the endocarditis had gotten so bad in my heart by then, like, yeah, I mean, I was just, I had to have open heart surgery regardless. That was, that was a give. Thank God I don't have to be open heart now, but um, yeah. <laughs> my fever, I had lesions on my brain by this point in time, which they don't know if that was there when I was in on the 6th, um, but when they drew my blood, like 17% of my blood was just straight infection. Like the doctor told my mom that uh, the fact that she's lucid, like, or she's, uh, she's responding, she may not be lucid, but she's, you know, awake is a miracle because I don't think she would have made it another, I, she wouldn't have made it till noon today. But because of the way I was treated at the one emergency department by that one nurse, because I was an addict and accused of dope seeking, I left AMA. My cornea perforated. Now, granted, all this is because of my own addiction. That's my fault. That's my responsibility to own that. Um, it's my responsibility to, to own that it was my decisions that led me down that road. It was my disease. It was my addiction. It was my habit. However, she didn't have to treat me the way she did. As you know, I, you know, as a result of my addiction and what I've gone through, I've started my own outreach. And my things that I want to target is education on destigmatization. I have to have my eye removed and a prosthetic put in. I'm totally blind in my left eye. Okay, so there's one thing you could say to that person right now. Hmm. You know, I, I, I can't blame her. I can't hate her for it. I mean, it's 
it's how she, it's what she's learned. It's it's a learned behavior. It's it's you know, if I could say, if I could not so much say one thing, if I could just sit down and it, I guess explain to her how educator. If I could do one thing, it would be that to to treat across the board everybody the same, regardless if they're an addict or. You know, if, if, if they're, you know, a parent, a child, a grandparent, a man, woman, gay, like, you know, trans, it doesn't matter. An addict, just treat everybody the same. With humanity. Exactly. And self-stigma. So, <clears throat> I think we can agree that pretty much all of us, at some point in our lives, and sometimes every day, we are our own worst class. Critic. Yes. And have you had an experience where judging yourself has caused a barrier for something that is really good and important for your life? Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the beginning where I grew up thinking I could be anything that, you know with the confidence and strength and every man is equal and so if they can do it I can do it you know and so that I couldn't quit by myself that I had this that's what started the stigma you know that I I can't quit you know and it made it prolonged and wasted so many years of my life just from me putting the stigma on myself and I would I would just say that this is a disease don't wait just like diabetes or anything else, don't go get help as soon as possible. You know, this this isn't you. You may you made a mistake by you know trying drugs, but after that it it becomes a disease. You know, it's not you're dependent. You're you're being brain chemistry has changed your it's not your fault you know so to say the first decision yeah to use maybe but high school these days middle schools these days it's all around you there's so much peer pressure and it just happens to so many kids and then their whole what I see is their whole twenties going through this and then some never get better, but you know, by the time they're 30, they realize my life, I'm not going to be able to have a family. I'm not going to be able to have a good job. And that's sometimes when they finally stop putting the stigma on them themselves and reaching out for help and getting they're getting treated that's a hard one it, it was farther back um there wasn't a lot of clinics the thinking was different you know it's that it was a moral failing that i was just making bad choices and it wasn't till a lot of reading by me and my dad that we realized that i can't just beat this by sheer willpower or some some people have but it's very small percentage um you know and you need help and i would tell myself get that help as soon as possible you know what you want in life you know you want your a family you know you want a good job you want to provide for them you you want to be part of your family you want to the bridges you burn you want to re, you know rebuild them and i would just tell myself i 
knew what the future hold, held of losing your car, you're losing your house, your family's not talking to you, you know, and I would honestly go farther back and have a recording of this time in my life and say, you know, start now. I mean, do something now because you're not going to just, you tell yourself you're going to use one more day, one more week, you're only 20. And then when you're at 25, you know, still not too bad. I'm only 25. And then you're 30. And then, you know, I got clean when I was, I was 32. And I'm grateful because I was still able to have a family. And I had someone that never gave up on me. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I wasted a whole decade that I could have been you know, just had so much more if I wouldn't have been so em embarrassed and put the stigma on myself. Thanks for being here today. Of course. And I'm excited um, to have the honor of listening to your story about a time in your life where you felt stigmatized. Okay, definitely. Um, well, this has to do with me being stigmatized by my family, so to speak, um, and it has to do with my addiction. Um, I was heavily a heavy crack cocaine user at one point in time before I actually moved on to methamphetamine, but that's another story entirely. Anyway, stimulants have always been my drug of choice. Anyhow, um, anybody that's had a crack cocaine addiction or any addiction, really, it, it is a very expensive addiction. Anyhow, long story short, um, the easiest way to take advantage of someone is to take advantage of someone and manipulate someone that cares about you and loves you. So um, I ended up stealing a significant amount of money from my mother. And the hardest thing about that is because my mother is the one and only person that never gave up on me. and <laughs> But she was also the easiest victim for me because she it was easy to manipulate her because she'd do anything for me so anyhow i ended up stealing some money from her um quite a bit of a couple thousand dollars you know in bad checks through a certain period of time well it came to light and um i explained to her that i had a problem which she wasn't aware of at the time i mean my my family is very i don't they're educated in a college sense, but they are not street educated whatsoever. None of them have dealt with addiction. My family on either side has never really dealt with addiction until I came about. So I basically got disowned by my family, so to speak, when I needed them the most. And I don't want to say that they turned my mother against me at a point in time, but they, they didn't understand addiction. They figured it was my choice. How could you steal from mom? How could you possibly do that? The one person that's had your back your entire life you steal from. They didn't understand that it was the addiction driving my, I didn't care about anything but my next high. I didn't see my family. I would have stole from my own child. You know, I would have thrown anybody under the bus for my next hit. But they didn't understand that. So, um. They stopped talking to me. Um, one of my sisters still doesn't talk to me to this day. This was nine to ten years ago. Um, and other family members, aunts, uncles, and so forth, um, I'll see them at family gatherings, and they will, you know, politely say hi to me for my mother's sake, but you can just tell in their faces they don't want to have anything to do with me. And I think the main part of it is just that they don't understand. They aren't educated about addiction. They feel like I made those choices and I purposely hurt my, hurt the person who cared about me the most and so forth. And I just, I don't feel like they still understand it. But to this day, they still hold a lot of resentment towards me. And I'm working on trying to fix that and make my amends and so forth. But they aren't willing yet 
to hear my side of story or accept my apology or anything like that. So it's kind of tough because I lost a lot of family members because of it. Mm -hmm. That's a big, that's a big cost. Yeah, definitely. So do you feel like the judgment from your family impacted your use? Absolutely. How? I mean, um, well, my use increase uh, you know you would think it would decrease once i got caught stealing money from my mother you think i would want to but i feel like it fed my addiction more because now i felt like it was basically me against the world i had i had ruined my mother's trust you know, all her you know all her faith in me oh he's getting better he's trying all of that went out the window and she was the only real one who had still stuck with me to this point everybody had already gave up on me and my family you know and so now that i did that to her and she found out and she was rightfully very pissed at me she didn't want to talk to me either at that point in time so I felt completely all alone in the world and I felt like I didn't have anything to lose so instead of you know trying to seek help or get I, I my use increased and I ended up getting much more strung out so to speak than I was before this happened and I I feel like the loneliness is the loneliness will will definitely break you. I mean, that's one of the hugest triggers. And I felt like I was all alone. None of my family wanted to talk to me. And the only people that I had, you know, any contact with were friends. But now being sober, none of those people were my friends. They were just drug associates that would chase chase their high with me. None of them were actually my friends. The loneliness. Yes. Is the greatest impact on use. Uh, on use, on relapse, on depression, on anything that goes with addiction, in my opinion. Um, because even when you can be surrounded by a hundred people, but you don't, when you're in the dope game, so to speak, you can't trust a single one person that's around you. You know what I mean? You always have to watch over your shoulder and you're wondering what they're doing or if they're plotting on you. It's just a, it's just a horrible existence. But I mean, even the people are around, you could have a bunch of people around you and you'd still feel lonely because you know that each and every one of those people would, at, would jump at the first opportunity to stab you in the back. So even when you're surrounded by people, I mean, it's the loneliness is still there because you can't trust anyone and you don't trust yourself. And you know, you don't know what you're capable of. So, mm. yeah, it's pretty lonely existence, definitely. What has happened since your recovery? Like, well, how do you feel like you've regained something? Okay, well, first and foremost, I regained the relationship with my mother, which was humongous. I mean, we're closer than we've ever been. I actually am living with her and she's elderly. So I'm kind of helping her out with things around the house, yard work and stuff. She has a big old house and it's just a lot to deal with for her. So I actually, you know, we're closer than we've ever been. And that was the most important relationship. And my biggest regret was, you know, damaging that relationship with her. So that's the biggest thing is getting my relationship with, and I'm slowly gaining back my sister's trust. Um, you know, one of them still doesn't want to talk to me, but she actually, I actually um, got a Christmas card from her. So that's a start. I mean, it just said Merry Christmas from her and that was it, but that was something and I was surprised and that made me kind of happy. So I, I'm 17 months clean now. So I have pretty good little chunk of time under my belt. So I think the more time that goes on, the more that Hopefully they see that I'm serious about it this time. I mean, because I, I had countless times of two and three months clean and, you know, go into jail and come out after six months clean, you know, but you only last a few weeks. And, you know, I never, other than being incarcerated, I never had a period of sobriety that was my choice. You know, it wasn't my choice to be incarcerated. The only reason I wasn't using is because I was incarcerated. I never had any desire to quit. Even incarceration didn't give me that. So, um, you know, so having this much clean time is definitely, I think, hopefully, you know, giving them an idea that I'm serious this time, like I said, and, you know, I'm serious about staying clean and hopefully they'll come around, you know, but you got to 
you know, I hurt a lot of people in a lot of big ways. So I have to, I have to take into account that w- what I did to them. I mean, their resentment is probably justified. I mean, you know, or their their anger is justified because I did some horrible things to a lot of the people that cared about me the most, as most addicts do. You know, so. But I I hope with the, you know the longer I stay clean and the more. You know, the more things like this, I, you know, community outreach, and I try to help homeless, and I get on the Helping Pueblo Facebook page, and I try to help people out in little ways as much as I can, you know. So I hope they're seeing all of this, and they'll hopefully gain back my, my relationship with the rest of my family. Recovery from stimulants, because there's no medically assisted treatment. What's yeah. that look like? It's all behavioral health? It, it is basically my methamphetamine stimulants or... I want to say more of a mental than a physical withdrawal. It's definitely a more mental Mm -hmm. depression and, you know, suicidal thoughts and ideations and just wanting to do nothing but sleep. And it's, it's really similar to like major depression is like how I would describe the, the withdrawals from, at least in my experience, from cocaine and methamphetamine. There isn't too much, at least in my experience. I mean, I wasn't the heaviest user, but I was definitely, you know, did enough. So, I mean, from my experience, I didn't really, other than tiredness and fatigue, really feel any physical withdrawals. It was all mental. And I don't think without the help of some professional you know, therapy and stuff that I got through health solutions at the beginning and stuff like that. I'm not sure I would have made it because it's definitely, you definitely, it definitely brings on some mental, mental health issues. And even if you didn't have mental health issues before, if you've had a methamphetamine addiction that's longer than a couple months, you probably have them now. So wow. the mental health aspect of it is, is, is definitely a lot more. I, I describe heroin, which all is physical and methamphetamine or as mental that would be the my best way to describe it because there isn't too many physical symptoms but it definitely brings on a lot of mental mental issues well um, i wasn't before diagnosed but after i got clean i was diagnosed with adult adhd ptsd um major depression and anxiety and before i was only diagnosed with the depression before my methamphetamine use afterwards you know um they so i don't know if all those issues were brought on by the methamphetamine but it definitely does affect your mental health and i think anybody with a stimulant addiction should seek um co-occurring treatment rather than just you know focusing on because the mental health especially i'm sure with any substance i believe but methamphetamine in particular is really really hard on your brain so and 17 months clean and well, i mean i feel like my brain is finally back to normal and this was just recently wow i mean it literally takes years sometimes for your brain function to get rewired back the right way so. i would call that a pretty big regain too yeah <laughs> i was i was i mean i'd be opiate user and I, it was kind of easier for me to use and get away with it, you know, because I, I was working professionally and going to grad school, and you know, uh, I actually had come out of the military, uh, the Army Reserve. And so, um, I guess like the moment that really stands out for me, and I was I was doing peer support work here, and I was at the courthouse, and you know, and I identified as a peer specialist. Oh, I'm in recovery. I was in, you know an opiate user myself and you know one of the professionals just said I'm like you're you're a drug addict you don't look like one you know and it was like what and that's just kind of what stands out to me I guess I've kind of maybe been able to skate by a little bit without some stigma because of that don't look like a drug addict whatever that means and I'm sure people have that image in their head you know we all do um and so um you know, so it was like reverse, not reverse stigma, but like stigma, I don't know, by proxy, third party, I don't know, you know, just like what does a drug addict look like? I mean, a lot of opiate addicts are doctors and nurses, you know, and so just, and I was owning it, you know, like because of addiction, I now have a career that I love, you know, and so like, yeah, it sucked, but now it's should that the addiction changed the trajectory of my life and put me on a course where I'm happy to go to work. You know, I'm not drudging in an office, and you know, and so it's I don't know. That just was a moment where I 
was like, what, what should I, <laughs> I'm glad that I looked away, I, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. So, so, yeah, and I'm sure that person meant, well, I don't think that they meant to, I, maybe they thought they were complimenting me, you know, but still, uh, you know. But it, it gave you pause to question yeah. uh, your own experience? Yeah, like what, and I, I'm sure mine was different, you know, it's kind of, you know, um, like I said, I was working professionally and was kind of able to, to stay under the radar, if you will, N not the whole time. Obviously, addiction, you know, it's, it's hard to get away with forever. It, it breaks you down physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, you know, and I was spending all my money on drugs, so eventually I'm, you know, barely paying the rent and then having to move back in with mom and all this stuff, you know. So eventually you had to stop, but that just kind of caught me, like, Huh. So were you actively using when that comment was made? No, no, no. I was working, but, you know, I had identified, hey, I'm a peer, I'm here, I'm here to work with some, you know, I'm, as an addict, and that's my role here. And that person, you know, was like, what? You know, you're a addict? You don't look like one, you know? And so, yeah, it was just, um, I, I guess sometimes, um, I, I mean, obviously, as a peer, they, they know that I have the lived experience. Um, and I was pretty, I'm always pretty open about it. Um, you know, I mean, it's given me a career and a life and I enjoy it. But, you know, it was still a kind of an experience that obviously because of stigma, you know, maybe might change other people's perceptions. So I would say that I'm careful with disclosure sometimes um, or might, might wait, you know, let someone get to know me a little before, you know. I, I guess I, I think that, like, Maybe people, or maybe I think, or people might think, oh, just a drug addict, well, now you can't be successful, you can't be a professional, you can't have an education, you can't be a good parent, or own a home, or, you know, not be a criminal, or this, that, and the other, or or look healthy, or be attractive, or whatever, you know, and so I, I guess maybe that, that might be what people might think, is that, oh, you're, you're just this, or your life is stuck, and you're only ever going to be that and you know may not be able to have success with fi you know finances or career or um, have good hobbies and you know good friends you know, not just associate with criminals or, or drug addicts or dealers or whatever you know so mm. I think maybe that's the, the image that people might have or that you know why I just don't so do you think this person was saying, even though you're in your recovery, you would still look like I imagine. Right. <laughs> yeah, so many Right, yeah, exactly. Or, or maybe a person looks a certain way, physically, you know, racially. Um, so we went with, yeah, to be able to know what they thought. Right. But the way, yeah, like that. I mean, I, I understand now. I thought it was a compliment. Yeah, honestly, I do. I think they thought they were con or saying something nice, like, oh, good for you. You don't look like shit, you know? <laughs> like, whatever, okay. <laughs> that kind of yeah. yeah. So I think they meant well in some way. Yeah. But it was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know that if it would happen again, I would be like, whoa, hold on. What, what am I supposed to look like then? You know, or what is an addict supposed to look like? Um, do you still identify as an addict? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or in recovery. Yeah. And and I did definitely disclose to our, our people that we work with and the parents in the course that we work with. And, and that's the big kind of, and that's why we're there with the lived experience. Yeah. You know, to say, hey, I've been where you are. I know the struggle. And you can come out on the other side. Right. And, and so I think that that's kind of, I guess, maybe the change is to, you, you know, you can come out on the other side and you can, you know, have, you know, whatever, whatever you want, or, or be successful, or whatever, um, and, and so. And it's so good to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. Thank you for sharing your life story, a bit of your life story with me today. You're welcome. And, and, and there, was a, there was a time, like, when I got on that program, I was just like, you mean, I'm a drug addict. Nobody's going to help a drug addict. Nobody wants to help a drug addict. You mean, and when I sat there and I told Veronica Gold my story, and she just, 
And to, to this day, like, I'm going to be signing the papers and getting off that program here any day now. And she calls me her little starfish. She says about the story about the, the little boy walking on the beach throwing starfish back in the ocean. And some man said, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving the starfish. He goes, you can't save mom. He picked up a starfish. She goes, I saved that one. So she, she calls me her little starfish. It's just hard because people don't, <clears throat> you give up on yourself. You give up on your own self. Like, you mean I had a bag of clothes to my name? That's what I had. It was a bag of clothes. Who wants to help this old lady with a bag of clothes? And now I see, like, all the help that there is, you know, the peer recoveries and, and stuff like that. And when I first got in the, into what, the peer recovery, I, I was like, man, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fix all these people. I'm going to fix them and I'm going to tell them, you know, this and this and that. But it's not. It, you can't fix anybody. You have to just show them how to find themselves and fix themselves. And it's like, but it is like so, it's so often because like my church I go to, like I had to te testimony like when I first, I didn't go to church because God didn't, he wouldn't let me do this. I mean, he wouldn't let me get high. He wouldn't let me list, get molested. He wouldn't let, you know, me get beaten like he wouldn't have let my, my parents give me away to somebody that was going to do all this to me. Like, that, like there it got me a God because he wouldn't have let that happen. But, you know, it, it took me a while to come to that. It wasn't God doing it, and it was free will. Because I, I, I felt I was I was dealt a bad hand in life, so I had the right to do whatever I wanted to do. Actually, this last two years, I'm going two years clean now. And this last two years, it, I, my eyes have opened, like, so much of forgiveness and letting go and, and you know, living your life. Like, I can't, I can't change anybody. I can't change anybody's thoughts. But I think if I would change anybody's thoughts, it's about addiction. When you're asked in first and second grade, what do you want to be, you know, a zookeeper, a, a firefighter, a lawyer, a police department? I mean, nobody at two or three says, oh, I want to grow up and be an addict. I want to destroy my life. You know, it's not something that's planned. What does help look like? Because you said encouragement. It's encouragement. It's understanding. It's non-judgmental. It's just understanding. Like, you mean, I know. I've been there. I know what you mean. You mean, and, and to have somebody, and if you have somebody that believes you can do it, it makes it a whole lot easier to do it. Because if you're, when you do something good, they're like, hey, that's so good. I'm so proud of you. And if you mess up, it's like, okay, it's a little setback. But you, you, you mean you had a little stumble, but you're not laying on the ground. Nobody knows what anybody's going through. You mean, nobody knows, you know, maybe they just lost their kids or their parents or their you know what I mean maybe, maybe they're lost they don't they don't maybe they lost everything they knew maybe you know something happened that we have no idea what we don't know what anybody's going through and you know what you know you know hey you know are you hungry do you want to go for a walk do this and that okay can I see you tomorrow I break it down where we could try and figure out what we could do to help her what she could do to help herself is what it is she has to yeah, help herself yeah Jean, I'm so happy to sit here with you today and talk a little bit about the idea of stigma. And sometimes it's the things that we tell ourselves and it's sometimes the things that we hear from others that we believe in. And can you think of a circumstance like that that occurred for you? Um, yeah, yeah I, I stigmatized myself a lot throughout my my substance use um as far as stigma for others i really there's one particular instance where i look back on frequently that i think unintentionally stigmatized me for a long period of time which was um i was 14 uh in my very first treatment center um and you know i was under the impression that i was still you know, experimenting. I was 14 years old. I was experimenting. Yes, I was using drugs and I was drinking alcohol regularly, but it was all an experimentation. Um, and I ended up in a treatment center. Um, and I had to go to NA and AA meetings. 
Um, and I remember going into the first one, it was an NA meeting, and basically everyone in the room self-identified as an addict. And um, I, I really don't remember. I don't remember if somebody said, you know, you have to identify as an alcoholic or an addict, but I just remember identifying as I'm Jean and I'm an addict. And um, that, it was kind of like a d defining moment, like, I'm an addict. When I didn't really believe that, like, I didn't believe that I was an addict at that point in time. Um, and so those words, saying them myself, are something that I used for years to come after that. Anytime I was in a bad st headspace, it was like, I'll show you, I'm a drug addict, right? I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. Do you want to see a drug addict and an alcoholic? I'll show you one, um, because that's what I am. And um, I, don't, I don't think that, that everybody experiences that. And years later, when I got into recovery, I was really, I felt, I felt a lot of um, gratitude for being an addict, because it made me who I am. But... It's words that, I, those words I've learned not to use, um, not to call myself and not to call other people alcoholics or addicts, only because I realize that my words and other people's words can cause unintentional harm to someone um, and stigmatize them, and you may never even realize that it's done that. And so... I really try to refrain from those words. Other people could call themselves that. If I go to an AA meeting or an NA meeting, I have no problem identifying um, as, as that. But when I'm out in the real world, I try not to use those words just because I don't know who it's going to affect. Um, and I never want to put a label on somebody that doesn't fit. And... Uh, most labels don't really necessarily fit, right? I mean, they're, they're generalizations, and generalizations are most of the time inaccurate. So, um, I don't know. I, I don't like to use those types of words. Do you find that, I, I've been asking others that I've spoken to, if they still consider themselves an addict, even though they're no longer actively using so I definitely still struggle with substance use. I think I'll always struggle with substance use. I am in active recovery and have been for six and a half years. Um, I don't think that's ever going to go away. I hope it doesn't ever go away, honestly, because I feel like if it ever does go away, I might run into some problems again in my life. So I like, you know, I want, I want to keep it in my mind that because really, but for me, being in recovery is about a path to wellness mm. and a self-directed life. Um, and so what's wrong with a path to wellness and a self-directed life? If I'm always working on self-improvement and, um, you know, having a life that is mine to hold on to, uh, you know, I'm always getting better. I'm staying teachable and learning. Yeah. So, I mean, I like my life in recovery, so I have no problem with the fact that I really, truly believe I'll always probably struggle with substance use, because that keeps me in my path to recovery, so. That is a big deal. Yeah. Because I've, I've heard someone else identify saying that they're no longer an addict, but they use the word, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, and there's, you know, there are people, so there's different, um, models as far as, um, like the recovery pathway goes. And in some models, it shows an exit, right? An exit from recovery. And there are definitely people out there that feel like, um, you know, they've been stabilized for, mo for long enough. They've, you know, maintained this and they've they now use their tools automatically rather than, which is great. You know, I don't think that, you know, I think everybody has their own journey that they take. I just really feel like 
recovery to me is a lifelong thing because it's not even necessarily about the substances. It's about self-improvement and um, continuing to learn and, you know, always realizing that I'm vulnerable to certain things and just being aware of that. So the one thing I always love asking you is what what's the one thing you want like our audience to know? about stigma or maybe the words that they use or I just think that words are so 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 powerful um you know I we've talked before about other stigmatizing things that you know people have said um like with my children right if you just loved your son enough you would stop using um and they were not it's not that they were you know, they had bad intentions when they said those things. They really just wanted me to get better. And they wanted me to buy into recovery. Um, but that's not what those words did to me. What those words did to me were reinforce my self-stigma that I'm a bad mom. And when I tell myself I'm a bad mom, that shame pushes me away from my son. It doesn't bring me closer to him. It pushes me deeper and deeper and deeper into the use because if I'm a bad mom, I can't be trusted around my son, right? So so rather than trying to get closer to him and develop that relationship and get better, I get further away because he shouldn't be around me because I'm a bad mom. So um, I think that's the most important thing people should recognize about stigma is that words, even if they're very well-intentioned, can can hit people in so many different ways that you, you just don't realize. Um, and, you know, it's um, not that, you know, people are going to be affected by everything that we say, um, but there are certain ways that you can approach things uh, that, you know, are less stigmatizing. I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> but if you're just conscious of what you say and put some thought into the words that you say, um, you know, the words clean and dirty when it comes to substance use get tossed around all the time. Um, and I just don't think <laughs> those dirty is a feel good type of a word, right? It doesn't feel good to be called dirty. Um, so, you know, I think if we're just a little bit more conscious about the way that things sound or come across or how you would feel if somebody were used those same words about you, you know, just be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? There comes a time when being hypnotized by self-doubt is just self-indulgent. If you want to grow, focus on the actions that you want to take instead of what my emotions dictate. That's good. Can you read the hypnotize part again one more time? Hold on. I want to get that in really quick. I can, I can send it to you. Yes. There comes a time when being hypnotized by self-doubt is just self-indulgent. I love that. I love that part because it's so true. We do. It's this, like, obsession of how, like, yes. And I talk to people that I work with all the time about it, that if we allow ourselves to be stuck in that negative misery and all of that stuff, we allow it. Right. It's okay to do it, but just recognize that you are allowing it, and you are accepting that in your life. That's your decision. You know, it's okay for everyone to get down and self-doubt and all that stuff, but if you allow it to take over you, hypnotize you, it's a choice that you're making because you have the ability to get out of it. So I love that. Will you please send that to me? I will. I'm going to I have a few people in mind that I'm going to send that to. I sure will. I, I really, I mean, I've been collecting these kind of things because 
I feel like the most damaging stigma that happens is the self stigma. For sure. And I want to make a shift for people to stand in their own power again and say, if I love myself and I forgive myself and I give myself a free pass on the mistakes that I've made, Mm -hmm. then I can hear a lot of things and not take them personally. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, like, building that resiliency because you know your own value Mm -hmm. and your own worth. And I need to hear that. Like, so I'm going to be playing that back. But (laughs) (laughs) that's kind of what I hope will happen. Yeah. Yeah, me too. But definitely our own. We are our own worst critics, that's for sure. And we, you know, because still, I mean, I still do it, you know. Whenever my oldest son, you know, does something or gives me 17-year-old attitude or whatever, it's this, like, little ting in my heart that's like, what did I do wrong? (laughs) Why am I, you know, like, I must be doing something wrong. And I think, I really think that most parents feel that way, Um, (laughs) you know? But then you add substance use on, and the fact that I was, you know, void from his life for for years, I mean years, I mean I was there in and out. I was there in and out. Not, definitely not enough, and I definitely ma- did some things to majorly disappoint him and hurt him and stuff, um, but uh, you add that on top of that already normal parental guilt... And it's a whole other thing. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's it's still there. But I think I'm far enough along in the process to be like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm, I, I did a lot of things wrong. But that has nothing to do with him being a 17-year-old and, you know, sometimes being snotty to his mother. Right. <laughs> Hopefully he outgrows it <laughs> quickly. Yes, yes. I think this is great. A lot of drinks have to work. Uh, it's waking up, having to uh, have alcohol in my system in order to function and uh, go to work. And then, of course, um, at the time, I was a barber, so you cannot have your hands shake <laughs> when you're trying to cut hair. So that, in turn, uh, led me to taking shooters and bottles of vodka and hiding them in my Jeep. And... Um, you know, I had lost, because of that, uh, my performance level had went down so far. Um, you know, I was being labeled as an alcoholic um, all the time, even though I know that I come from a family of heavy drinkers and, and definite al- alcoholics. Um, you know, I, I didn't want that label um, whatsoever. And uh, I guess the defining moment for me, I remember... Um, I had a little house, um, my last house when I lived in Colorado Springs, um, had a huge picture window and unfortunately there was a liquor store across the street and that was the moment, you know, I I remember standing in the window and crying, begging for help because at that point I knew I didn't want to drink anymore. Um, I had lost a job because of it that I had 13 years and then I had actually succession worked at four other places immediately after and got fired from all of them um so i knew i had a problem at that moment i mean i was begging the universe to uh get me help um i didn't know how that was gonna happen but uh you know the universe listened and i immediately ended up getting a dui um so I was forced uh, legally into treatment, which did help some, but uh, I never worked with uh, people like in peer support or people that actually had lived experience, knew the system, had, had to go through court, uh, had to experience getting help in the right ways. You know, I think if I had had a mentor or someone maybe to hold my hand, it would have been different. Um, so, you know, the, the, 
thing is, uh, subsequently, um, after that one, within two years, I got two more DUIs, ended up in Pueblo, and ended up in a severe treatment facility. Um, I was facing six years in federal prison for my last DUI, um, but, you know, by the grace of God, I don't know how it happened, um, I ended up knowing the right people at the right time. I didn't end up in jail. I ended up with four years of probation, which I completed in under two. Um, but that's how I got it into becoming a peer specialist because um, I'm over three years uh, sober now. But the stigma is still above me, even though I talk about alcoholism, like to clients and people that I'm trying to assist. Um, if I were sitting down, um, with someone that is a, a normie, I guess, or people that has, haven't uh, experienced people that have, have suffered from substance abuse. You know, if I were talking to someone that hadn't experienced that in a normal conversation, um, if I admit it, it's like, well, I'm an alcoholic. All of a sudden, their whole um, visual uh, identity of me changes. I mean, you can see it in their face. Uh, they become apprehensive or I think, you know, they lose trust or they're always watching your actions to see if you're slightly off or, you know, if you're not feeling well, it's like, why did, did you relapse? Did, you know, there's always that, um, which I can openly talk about now, but if you weren't a strong willed person, um, it would be easy, you know, because of others, people, other people's judgments to, go right back to where I started. Um, so it's, it's a struggle every day, you know, and then after the suicides as well, you know, even though it's not really substance abuse uh, related, I can definitely tell you, you know, um, because that affected my emotional levels, um, my depression. And of course I, I had a, a huge uh, business going. So I was dealing with the public every day, but you know, as soon as they find out, uh, and I have clients, honestly, for over 20 years that immediately dropped me because all of a sudden people started calling me suicide boy or like if they hung, or if they hung around me that bad things were going to happen to them. And um, which, you know, all, all of that at once definitely, of course, forced me into uh, the alcoholic state that I ended up in. So um, I'm just glad to be on the other side. Yeah, I am too. So I really am too. Do you feel like the external stigma is what triggers the internal stigma? You know, I I, I believe it, it could, you know, because it's like there, there are days, you know, it's like if I felt like it, it's like, well, I've worked this hard. So, you know, or someone, if you keep repeat, if people keep telling you that you're something, mm -hmm. um, you begin to believe it again, mm -hmm. you know. And um, it would be easy to just be complacent and say, well, screw it. You know, if you're saying that about me, I guess I might as well do it again. Um, you know, it would be easy to fall back into that trap, you know, because if that's what you believe I am, then I might as well be that, you know. Um, I'm just glad that I work with, you know, such a good support system and I... Uh, help teach recovery now so you know I'm, I'm always on the other side you know and uh, I get to work with people that are unfortunately going through the court system um, I know it sounds strange but honestly that's the best thing that's ever happened to me because I can see every day where I don't want to be I don't want to be in cuffs I don't want to be in a suit standing in front of the judge I don't want someone in control of my future forcing me into things, um, you know. So I, I'm in a really good place now. I hate the fact that um, I had to go through what I went through to get a better life, but um, I guess that's why I'm here because I can show people that now, you know, give them some encouragement. So. Mm -hmm. That lived experience is powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. Honestly, the helplessness, um, the biggest thing that stands out in my mind 
was me standing in front of that picture window crying. Oh, God. Because I was helpless, hopeless, um, I had nothing, oh. nothing. And you know, <laughs> another thing is I did not want to drink, but in my head, but my body was so programmed at that time without having control. I literally turned around and walked out of the house and I was crying my eyes out bawling, walking across the street to the liquor store, standing in front of the door, and I didn't want to go in, and I was just sobbing. And I had to wipe my tears away, and because I was shaking so bad from D DTs, I was like, am I going to die if I do, or am I going to die if I don't? So my husband had committed suicide, um, and... Shortly after that, I was on the phone with him. Uh -huh. So it was shortly after that that I had started using meth. Um, and my family had looked down on that. I was raised in a family that they were church going, you know. So me using any type of substance was not a good thing. You know, so I couldn't reach out to them, you know. Um, I, my friends used, so um, I there was just a lot of stigma around my use. I mean, I couldn't, um, it was just looked down on with it. I was a mother of five, or at the time I was a mother of three, but also in my addiction I had um, two other children, so that also with everybody, I was a bad mother because I was using, um, so I don't know, um, it was just, it was hard. You know, because I knew it. I was embarrassed by it. I couldn't stop it, you know. Um, but also at, at the point where um, I didn't want to sleep because um, I could hear my husband dying. So, um, yeah, it was, I don't know. Um, it was hard because I knew what I knew what people thought too. So that that made it even harder. Like um, So you started using meth so that you wouldn't sleep mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to relive your husband's dying. Did yes. you use a gun? Um, so, yes. So, he, yeah. yes. He had shot himself. So, um, and I was on the phone with him. So, it was, um, I left the house because he, my relationship wasn't good with him. So, he was also, an, he was an alcoholic. So, he was what they call high-functioning alcoholic. He worked you know, and then when he got home, he drank. So, um, I had left. So, three kids, yes. And um, our youngest one was one and a, one and a half um, when he when he died. But we also had one of his children, one of his younger children, with us at the time too. So. Um, it would, and not just my family didn't, I knew what my family thought, but I also knew what his family thought. I mean, not only by his drinking, you know, because that was acceptable to, his, to 
like more acceptable than drug use you know it wasn't looked down upon as much you know um my family didn't drink but my dad was in the alcohol industry so it wasn't quite like the drug use if that makes sense you know so when i started using it was it was a big deal you know um my brothers didn't want me around their children because um i was using you know so it was it was a lot of change you know for me and how I was treated. So my family would have birthday parties for their children and I wasn't invited to my nieces and nephews um, birthdays. So it was a lot. Um, and then when I stopped, um, before I stopped, so I had used for years, my children had grew up we had, I had another child. I was with this child's dad for almost 10 years, and our drug use was, I would say, out of control. And um, I was worried that we, somebody, we were going to die in our addiction. Um, and I wanted to stop at this time. Our children, my children were getting older and they were seeing this, and it wasn't all right, you know. My children were fine, you know. So um, I ended up leaving with my children. There was a lot of domestic violence also with this. Um, so I ended up leaving, and within two, two months, um, he had an overdose. When someone dies of natural causes, it's the reaction that people um, have is different from the reaction people have when it's a drug overdose. I think the way people are treated are different. Not being able to grieve and feel supported in your grief, how did that impact you? So I didn't for years. For the last 10 years, I did not ever talk about my experience. I moved to a new community. I just started over, but I did not talk about my experience. Like, um, so before this, I lived in Arizona and nobody, nobody knows about my past life because I don't want people to look down on me, um, on my past. So I lived in the community from 2011, I believe, to 2019, and nobody, none of my community knows my past. So. And this was Arizona? In Arizona, okay. yeah. So when I moved to Colorado, I wanted um, to talk about my life. I wanted, you know, to help others and to make more people aware you know so what do you want people to know um that it's okay it's okay to be not okay you know and if you need help to reach out that there are people who care so that's what i want that's beautiful what's intentional about the environment here that you've created this sense of family and warmth and connection and so I would say we well we are family so that naturally I feel like becomes our work because we get to work together our boys grew up here um I think the other part of it is is that we we always wanted this type of a setting for our children which is actually why we came to be here um I always wanted to work in education and when we kind of started the whole, like, getting married, having kids, and me going back to work, it was I want him to be, when it was just our first son, want him to be somewhere that I would feel safe leaving him, and I would feel that he's loved, and, you know, and that it's home away from home. Um, in that process, 
building blocks was born. So, you know, we were pretty young, the boys were four and eight months old when we opened, and so kind of in that same stage of life of what we do here. Um, we've created relationships with our staff, which I think spills into what we do with our families, um, you know, because we, we're nothing without them. So we need to make them part of our family, part of our plans, part of our daily um, goal, you know, for what we want here. So we get, we are very close to our staff, and I think that that's huge. And I, and I say that because I've worked in centers before we did this. I mean, I worked in quite a few centers um, once we finally got our own, and, and that was kind of the thing that was, it's hard to work in child care. It's hard. You put a lot into it, you know, emotionally and physically and, you know, mentally you put so much into it. And, and sometimes you don't feel any gratitude or respect or, you know, I don't know. You just don't really feel appreciated. Um, that feeling probably matters more to an extent to come from your boss because you truly interact with them or from your coworkers because you interact with them even more than you do with the parents. Um, so, you know, I think that that's important. So even if the struggle is there with the parent, sometimes, you know, parents have their own stuff going on and they're busy and crazy and whether they're appreciative or not may not take the time to show it or say it. But with staff, you know, we can be more intentional with them. You always can choose to be more intentional with your staff, whether it's just a coworker or your actual employee or your employer. Um, and that never felt like that was important anywhere else before here. Um, so I think that that became important to us because we, we also are with them all day. So obviously we want to build that relationship and enjoy them as well. So it's just, you know, it's just better for everybody. If, if we get to know each other and, you know, we have grace with each other and we encourage each other. Um, so that became a big part of how we run our centers. And so that is, I think one of the number one things that creates our environment here because we again are family but it's important to us to have that feeling and if we're not on the same page with our staff and we're not you know treating them the way that we would want to be treated or that we would want our children to be treated or us as parents if we were on that side of it um then why would we expect that in return you know from them so so i think that kind of just bled into what building blocks is you know, so we, we are a family. Our girls have been here. We have girls that have been here with us for, we've been open for 16 years, and I, we have a couple that have been with us 13, 14 years. Wow. Um, the newer ones are still in, like, the years, you know? <laughs> like, they're still a couple years, or younger girls. Um, we have other girls that have been with us eight years, you know? We have, we actually have had, we've hired a couple young <clears throat> girls that came here that attended here, and they came to do the job here because they remembered being at Building Blocks. So, um, you know, so it's kind of come full circle, and, and I, I do think that a big part of why we love what we do is because because we get to, well, we get to work together, which is huge, and we really enjoy that, but we we have that feeling here while we're here with our staff. It is, it is family with our staff, and I do think that that affects our daily work and how we how we treat the families how we treat the parents specifically how we treat the children specifically um some of our girls are parents but they're not all um and i think that just goes to show that you don't have to be a parent to really know how to be a family member and how to you know how to treat the kids the way that they treat them because we have a lot of girls that are younger and they don't have kids but their mamas here, you know, they, uh, they love these babies and they, they know how to just treat them with respect and with love and with, you know, the discipline that we obviously have to have here as well and to do all that in a loving way, no matter what. So it's just kind of become a family, a building blocks family. With staff, with families, I mean, we have families that we're still in touch with to this day that were some of our first families. When you talk about the environment that you're creating here, yeah. And it's like that love and discipline. Mm -hmm. How do you find that balance? Yeah. And what if we 
as an individual didn't have a family of origin that taught us that, is there a way that you see us being able to engender that for ourselves? We, I think that kind of goes back to why we chose to do this part. So very much of family and of love and, and of discipline because you can't have eight kids running amok and it's a one to eight ratio with mom and eight kids yeah. and the dad's working or dad's on the ranch. Um, so I, I think in, in that of learning or teaching to be respectful, which is so lost these days mm -hmm. of just be kind and be respectful that that can go so much further than, than anything else that you can teach. Cause if you're kind to your neighbor, you're kind to your buddy, then you get those reactions in return, hopefully. And if it's not the first time, it's the reaction. If you continue to be kind, you can rub off kindness on everyone around you and you can infect kindness around everyone around you. And you can also be infectious negatively also, but, but, but of that of being loving and caring and respectful. We used to talk about being respectful and kids would like, nod and understand and now it's, it's not, kind of, it's, it's not really often. understood anymore so we have to start instilling that again and starting from scratch of that's that's not the way that you speak to your parents and oh yeah it is well then that's not the way that we're going to speak here and we will be kind mm -hmm. and we will use kind words and we will be nice and mm -hmm. of seeing Seeing that is is a hard reality of the of the way that our world is headed. Yeah. If we're not able to to instill that in children, because you don't learn these things when you're forty years old. Typically, mm -hmm. you don't learn them when you're in middle school. It's mm -hmm. more of how was I raised, how was I brought up, and we've talked about that too. Of not. You'll never know the effect that you have on someone, and, and hopefully, hopefully it's a good effect. And not that any of these kids are going to come back and say, "Man, I'm so glad you made me sit in the thinking spot that day because <laughs> and talk to me you, about you sharing. spoke to me, yeah, about being kind." Yeah. Because I am a kind mother now. I am a kind father. I know how to mm. rear my family, whereas. I didn't see that at home, and none of the kids will ever come back and say that, but still grab a hold and have that hope that we have instilled that in them of, of please and thank you, of no thank you, or I don't like that, and just how to respond correctly and how to be emotional. But how to control your emotions. Emotions are good, it's great to be mad, it's okay to be sad, it's okay. But it's your reaction, it's how you how you use that emotion and how you explain or or show that emotion that sometimes it needs some help along the way. That's good. And I honestly can't imagine you know ch children are so impacted right especially these early years by what they see and by what they hear whether it's in their home um, in child care in, in elementary school but these first few years are are so important as far as shaping you know who they become um, and teaching empathy and teaching that respect and that kindness um, and kind of just like you said instilling it and making sure it's there Unfortunately, we see a lot of children that don't have that support at home. Any kind of support system. I, it, I can't imagine how you get there. Or an example. Yes. But yeah. Model. I think, right. And I think for the most part, even if they don't have it at home, because some of them don't, and that just really stinks, because that's just what they were born into. And it's not their fault or their choice. And they don't know any better, but that is what they were born into. Um, but most children 
at some point along the way do enter into childcare or preschool, um, and then eventually school. Like you know, typically, typically you're going to have children that enter that, and so um, as far as being able to, to teach that to them, that they are that they are good enough, and that you are capable of you know that empowerment of you're capable to, capable to make these choices. I don't know how you get to that point of being able to feel empowered if you don't have a support system. Mm -hmm. We are firm believers of, of, of a support system in the home and and following through here and then in school. Um, but we do see families that don't have it, you know, the children that don't have it in their home. There's no support, even as little as a three-year-old, you know, and it's just they, the expectations they have of them, which are super unrealistic, um, and it's just because they there's just not that support there. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think you you kind of become that person that you can be kind of self empowered and you know self motivated if somewhere along the way somebody made an impact, right? So it doesn't have to be. It, you might live in a really horrible home life, but my hope and prayer that we've always felt is that even if it's just the one kid in twenty years that we serve hundreds of kids. If there's that, if there is that kid that, you know, one that just will never know, but might have gone down a very different path. And because they were loved here, because they had consistency, because they had stability, even if it was just in this compartment of their life, right? Even if it was just this, you know, third of their day while they were here with us for that year, couple years, month, you know, you never know. But if Every time you interact with them, it's your moment to, you know, be that touch. I, I feel that in order for a person to get to that point, to have a fighting chance <laughs> to get to that point, um, there has to be somebody, right, that made a difference. And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be this, you know, monumental moment. It was just something, something stuck in their mind. Um, whether it was the kindness we showed them or the time we took to sit with them. You know, time is so precious. And I, you know, I can be affecting this person's life and not even know it. And you probably won't ever know it, you know, but that's just where the way that you act is so important. The way that you treat people, the way that you speak to people. With these little guys, yeah. you know, they're learning what love is and they're learning what relationships are. And they're learning by the way we behave what the word respect means and what the word kind means. Because those are words we use with them, how the other person feels, but it affects you too. Um, you can take whatever you learn from another human being and either learn to be like them or to not be like them. Because you like it or you don't. And But my, but my teacher tells me that she loves me even when I make a bad choice, because that is a conversation. Even when you make these bad choices, even when, you know, you choose not to listen, you choose to break a toy, you choose to tear something, you choose to whatever, um, I love you. It's no just the wrong what. choice. It doesn't, right. that doesn't mean that's who you You're are. not a bad that's boy. Just the choice yes. It's chose. Yes. behavior, not yes. A person. Yes. And that is, it is okay to make mistakes. And as much as it's frustrating, it's also okay to do them over and over because obviously something's going on if he's needing that attention or whatever. Um, or he's just figuring stuff out, like, I see what I can do. Um, and even when that's frustrating, because, you know, they can tell when the teachers are frustrated or, or if I'm like, you know, this is not okay. And they, they, they need to know that it's upsetting, you know, that this, is, this was a wrong choice or a bad choice or... A wrong idea, or you know, it makes me sad that you chose that. that. Not, not that I'm mad at you, right. but I'm sad mm -hmm. that you chose to mm -hmm. do this. Yeah. As opposed to, yeah, I'm exactly. happy when you mm -hmm. when made you made your bed or when yeah. you mm -hmm. yeah. cleaned up. Yeah. 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 And so we do. We talk about that a lot. Like it is. They will always. We will always all make bad choices at some point yeah. in our life. But to feel like you're not loved because of it is not okay. And as adults, I mean, not necessarily. I say as adults, you know, we can take that with a grain of salt. But if you're an adult who came from a home and a childhood that never told you that, then you would feel like you're not good enough, even as an adult. So if we're not teaching the kids that, mm. 
if we're not teaching them that they're loved no matter what, right. even when they mess up, right. then then we're in the wrong job. <laughs> like we're not we're not doing the right thing. Look at what you did do. That's great. Like it's you do great things. You don't only do these bad things, <laughs> you know. And sometimes we definitely forget to praise people. Yeah. I think it's much easier to find a flaw than to find something worth praising. Yeah. Just naturally human nature. Yeah. Um, so we've really worked at, you know, really pushing that. I like how you use your words, or I like how you, you know, shared your toy with him, or I like how you waited for Miss Kim to pour your milk or whatever. So we always try to praise them for things that you just assume are easy things to do. But Should be. Yeah. Sure. But they're not. Right? Well, it's not if everybody at the table was doing them. Right. You could say that. Right. Maybe. I started using when I was very, very young, as I've told you before. And a lot of that was based on uh, self-medicating my depression. I was extremely suicidal. Um, mom, and among other people, always told me that I would eat nothing, that I would never amount to nothing, that I was just this terrible person. And at the age of eight, I hated life and I wanted to die. So I started self-medicating a few years after that. I got clean when I was about 15 for two years, and my son, my first son that I got pregnant with, I went into early labor with, and he passed away. He didn't make it. And uh, so I went back to using, and I used for seven years straight. I did not grieve. I cremated him by myself. I went to labor by myself. All those things. I lost him by myself. And that was a, a huge moment for me. But... It wasn't a saving moment. At that point, I just decided life wasn't worth it anymore. For seven years straight. For seven years straight. And I wouldn't eat. I would barely drink liquids. I was literally trying to smoke myself into the grave. And I don't know at what point things changed for me, but I guess living up to everybody's expectation that I would never be nothing and then not understanding my pain... Um, really didn't resonate with me anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to continue to prove everybody right. And then I just decided it wasn't on them to understand my pain. It's not on them to understand it. It's on me to understand it. So that was really hard trying to figure out how am I going to make that change though. When I was so hurt and so alone, the high wasn't there anymore. Mm. You know, that quit being there for a while for a long time. It quit numbing me for a long time. It, it mm. quit speeding up the thoughts for a long time. It just wasn't serving its purpose, but it was still a form of survival. You know, to get from day to day, to have a roof over my head, or whatever the case may be. Or even just being able to stay awake so that way the person you're with can't rob you, or whatever. You know, depending on who you're with. The situations that come about I just decided it wasn't on anybody to understand my pain or to come to terms with it. And um, I did a lot of self-forgiveness. You can't live this life and have peace. You can't, can't live this life and have stability, even with a roof over your head or a job. You eventually lose that or you eventually lose yourself in all that still. You can't manifest all these things and to be one with yourself or to be one with the universe or one with anything else, whatever anybody's beliefs are, and still have this lifestyle. So I just had my aha moment. I was tired. Tired, sick, steadily throwing up. And I've been living this dedicated lifestyle to helping others find who they are in this world and where they belong in this world since. And I have 10 years clean now, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's worth it every step of the way. Yeah, absolutely. Identify who they are, because it's not everybody who you think it is. It's not, it's not mom and dad all the time. It's not your brother. Yes, you have to pick and choose. You have to be able to identify that. If you don't have that, where can you go to get that? And that's where all of us come into play now. And it's nice because, you know, mental health and substance help isn't such a big, oh, no, can't do that. You know, now it's encouraged. Now, you know, everybody is more for the awareness is there. The acceptance of it is there. 
the stigma is a little bit lower. It's still there, but it's a little bit lower than it was when when social learning is a real thing and it starts as soon as they go to school, as soon as they're in daycare, they start to learn these aspects, social learning. The world is now their influence, not us. And if we don't include ourselves in that, then we stay outside of that for lifelong. So the social world, again, is going to be where she leads support she's gonna have to identify who's good for her who's not so is he just like everybody else has to have to be able to do that or you're just gonna be lost and you're gonna feed that fear that you're always gonna be alone or those thoughts that you are alone when in reality you're not so Jonathan thanks for meeting with me about um, your words have power and those moments in life where uh, carelessly tossed word can sometimes change the whole trajectory of what we experience. Yes, it's, I'm happy to meet with you too. Um, it's been a pleasure just talking to you on the phone up to this point and you know I'm excited to see this project come through and, and know how what the impact is um, you know over the years. So I think it's a very powerful powerful message that you're trying to bring to the community who sometimes doesn't have help yeah. um, or know where to get help. If you were able to share with me your intention for your participation, what would that be? My intention is to not only show the people that are struggling with the stigma of substance use, but also just struggling with, you know, understanding where to go. Um, and that it's okay to struggle. You know, we all, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, as Brene Brown would say, we all have stories that will make you fall to your knees and, and cry. And, you know, so I hope that my story alone will help people understand that they're not alone in what they've dealt with in the past, um, but also have hope for the future and the fact that they can change it one step at a time. For me, when it comes to substance use, I I think I just it wasn't a it wasn't a one moment that that made me create us or not made me but uh, influenced me to creating a self stigma. Um, it was many different moments, you know, from um, the treatment center staff, you know, really taking that like, oh, you're here, so you are a problem, you know, and and it. And it you know, it's not, it, they didn't say it that direct, but it was, it was, you could tell it was there. You know, it was like, I mean, even take for instance, there were some times where staff would try to um, come out into the milieu and play cards with us. And they got in trouble. They got put in their place and they're set, they were told, you need to stay behind this nurse's desk and do paperwork. And you're spending too many, too much time with the clients and it's crossing boundaries. So, you know, in a, in a way, they created this us and them type of mentality um, that they promoted through words that they wanted to fight against. Wow. Um, so it was, it was very, I mean, not only in substance use, but in mental health. That's, that's the stigma that I came up in. And it was very punitive, very punitive. Now, that's not to say that the, in the entire treatment, everyone was that way. You know, there were some very influential people in my life throughout that treatment center and it made a huge difference. Uh, the people that were helpful, yes, they were much more engaged in the human to human and they were much more um, recognizing the whole human, not just parts. Um, because a lot of, I, I think a lot of them, well, I can't, I can't speak for them, but it just seemed like, um, you know, you many people identified you as a client and that's it, you know, and, and it was, yeah, it was hard, you know, recognizing that you had to ask for permission for so many different things that normally people don't have to. I, earlier you asked, um, you know, what that one defining moment was where I no longer wanted to die. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I was very suicidal after what happened. For about three years, uh, because of my story and what happened um, that led me onto this path. Well, you know, it was 
it was there were several defining moments, but one specifically within mental health of why I didn't want to pass away. Um, you know, for a long time I was I was grappling with this this longing for death and what occurred was, you know, they were teaching us a lot about mindfulness and, and growing in that sense. And, um, you know, it, for me, I took that mindfulness and guided imagery and I started to question, okay, I'm already in a box, but what if I took away even what I had in this box and I put myself in a smaller box with no sight, no sound, and just imagined that scenario and question what would keep me living at that point and if I found it at that point with nothing that would be a meaning that I can carry throughout the rest of my life um, and so for me it was very impactful to go through that mindfulness over and over until I recognized that um, you know the thing is is I'm being given a chance to breathe and if all I can do is be thankful that I be thankful to that that essence that's keeping me alive, that in itself is giving back, you know, and in addition, I'm giving back air to plants and helping other people live, you know, so even in that box, that small box with no sight, no sound, nothing, I was still doing something to give back um, and create a life worth living. And then from then on, it just, it turned into so much more. I mean, it, it just, it grew to a point where now I'm able to have a job where I can help people and I'm able to share my story um, and really guide people onto the path of recovery, whatever that looks like for them, because there's many different paths. Is that, uh, I have come to believe that recovery is unique to the individual and, and no two paths of recovery are alike. Oh, yes. Yes. Definitely. I mean, mine, thank goodness for my parents. Um, I was homeschooled from the kindergarten through high school. Um, and they, I mean, we went to business conferences, we went to all kinds of things. And I mean, I learned mainly from books. And there, in the hospital, I started reading books. And that was a huge influence because it's like, it turned into... I want to do my treatment for me, and I didn't think that they, what they had was enough for me, and I wanted to make sure that I never went back. And so I really took that to heart, and, and there were some amazing uh, peers that I met there. And there was one influential book that changed my mind on substance use, um, considering that my substance use was for uh, hallucinogenics and, and in that area. Um, but it was... The Only Dance There Is by Ram Das. So that was, that book alone was a huge influencer into like the idea that I wanted to do the work on my own, you know, and I wanted to remember everything that I go through and, and understand those, this spiritual journey that we're on, you know. Um, so that, that to me was like the, the defining moment of like, I'm done. You know, and, and it changed the course of my recovery, you know. Um, it made it more purposeful and, and uh, recognizing that I want to do this, not because I'm doing it for someone else. Right, because I guess, I'm, you know, when people enter into recovery as an extension of uh, hearing, you know, they're involved with the judicial system in some way, it, it is sort of an artificial state of readiness yes i guess that goes to mindfulness you know in the broad sense of recovery for me i've learned that mindfulness is a way of life not necessarily just uh sitting there and, and trying not to have thought in that moment and you can have awareness it's about awareness and, and noticing that cup of coffee that tastes really good or and, and the smell and being one in the moment it's a way of life you know, and so my my sense of recovery is just like that. You know, it's very broad. It's about recognizing moment to moment what I'm doing and being fully there.